Hello and welcome to Now and Zen. Today's episode is with Nicholas Denton Protzak, Canadian composer and cellist. I was listening to Into This Fracturing Land again. That's a really nice piece. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, I, it was quite an interesting process writing that particular work um, because um, I wrote it back in uh, kind of early 2020. And, um, or I, I, sorry, pardon me. I wrote it in uh, near the end of 2019. And then I revised it actually quite heavily um, a few months later. And um, I think the final product now, I'm, I'm very I'm very happy with it. And uh, in a lot of ways, I would say it's kind of like my calling card work because it kind of contains all of the ideas that I that I like to incorporate into my work. And that's the mixture of cello and um, and then also my composing and then uh, uh, a lot of kind of ecological elements uh, and field recordings and electronics and stuff like that. So it's definitely kind of my signature work in that in that regard. <laughs> mesmerized by the variety of textures you get out of having sort of higher like field recording noises and then including like a low element as sort of a punctuating thing it's uh, it's definitely something i've been thinking about a lot because actually the um the topic of my phd thesis is the study of the different ways in which um, music in the natural world can interface with one another and be inspired by one another um, and i would say that uh, microtonality and just intonation and all of that, that whole sort of world, I don't think that it's more natural like or anything, but I definitely see it as being a realm that is worth exploring within that sort of uh, musical idea and, and, uh, and, and area of research, I find, yeah. Has there been a lot of research done in that area, would you say? Um, and does it account for microtonality? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question. There has been definitely a decent amount of research done in the field of naturey music, for lack of a better word, actually the, the term that I use in my research is something called musical ecopoiesis, uh, which is the idea of 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 ecology and creating, and using looking at this from a musical perspective. Um, and it's it's interesting because in some areas there has been a lot of research done, but in, then in other areas there's not a lot. And and actually microtonality in relation to that is is one area that that has not been explored a lot. Interestingly enough, I mean th there are a few exceptions. Francois Bernard Mash he he has a um, has a really interesting book called um, uh, Music Myth and Nature, and in it he describes a tuning system that is in gradations of ten cents, I believe, and he talks about transcribing bird song with it. So so there are some examples of it, but not a whole lot. And what one thing that I find very interesting is that not a lot of people. Not a lot of musicians, composers, researchers have looked at it from a kind of broad perspective and sort of looked for themes and ideas that that permeate many different levels of, of that sort of field of study. It's always very specialized. It's a very kind of archipelago-like field, lots of dots here and there, and, and not a lot of sort of uh, uh, zoomed out um perspectives on it, which is what I'm kind of trying to do uh, from the perspective of my creative practice. Well, it sounds like you're... You're adding a lot to the field then, since you have this blend of uh, particular skills and are, are focusing on it in this way. And of course, it also helps that you understand the, the microtonality. Uh, I hear that um, in Into This Fracturing Land, it seems like a lot of the... Well, you're using 31 tone equal temperament for that, right? A mixture of 31 and also just strict JI and other places too. I, I sort of use them in a 
interchangeable kind of way. There's, it's not very um, rigorous. I just sort of, when I feel like using 31, I use 31. When I feel like using JI, I use JI. Does that um, manifest in your notation systems? Like, do you delineate between them in a specific way and use one notation system for one and one for another? Or do you just kind of like use JI notation for everything, but think of equal temperament in a particular way in certain passages? Or how does that work for you? That's a that's a great question. Um, in that particular work, I um, all of the notated material is in thirty one, uh, so the cello part is entirely in thirty one. It's mostly the electronics and some of the kind of um, analog style synthesized sort of um, oscillators that I have that are in JI. And I don't bother actually notating those in the score. I just say hey, there are chords here, and and I use a kind of graphic approach, or, or I shouldn't say graphic approach, approach, but rather a descriptive a descriptive approach in this score. It's actually getting pretty close to a year now. I've been working on this um, system of accidentals with uh, Dave Keenan, who of course everyone knows is one of the co-creators of sagittal notation. And I've uh, I've been, hopefully we'll, we'll release it out into the world relatively soon. It's it's the the, the accidentals themselves are done and we, we kind of want to uh, basically maybe write up a little pamphlet on how they work. Um, they're very closely related to sagittal. We're, we're calling them stoic sagittal because it's a kind of, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, yes, actually stoic sagittal is the, is the name that we're, we're sort of using and because it's a kind of simplification of the Athenian sagittal in, in a way. Yeah, so so with a system like that, actually, um, it's, it's designed to be flexible in such a way that one could, in a given score, uh, fluctuate between 31 equal or or um, or uh, JI or something close to it at least, much like sagittal itself can. Um, so that, that's that's an idea that I'm definitely thinking about exploring more for sure in, in my music. Yeah, and it's good that you're um coming up with notation to clarify that. It does seem like, of course, um, tuning based um, <laughs> notation systems definitely seem to break down when you when you want to get at uh, certain ideas. I, I know that uh, in my recent music, I've been exploring using lots of different tuning systems, um, almost, uh, you know, just to intentionally try to push the envelope in, in whatever way I can. So it's like, you know, if someone invents a notation system that's good for X, then um, there's definitely composers out there who will want to use Y just to see how that will work. I yeah. often wonder at scenarios where you have like equal temperament and just intonation, and you can move between them very freely. But what about scenarios where you have an equal temperament that's really, really not close to JI, but you want to morph between those sorts of systems instead, or at least not close to low limit JI? That might be something really interesting to explore. I'm assuming that uh, Athenian Sagittal could cover that, because is, is that the highest level one, or is that like Olympian or something? When it comes to Sagittal, I believe the highest, highest level one is... Uh, I might I might get this wrong, but it's like Magrethian Sagittal. But Oli Whoa. Olympian is Olympian is very high up. Um, there's another one called Herculean. Um, but uh, but actually, Athenian is is just one level up from Spartan. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So Athenian is actually kind of they. Um, from what I understand from from Dave and, and George's perspective, they consider that kind of like the baseline system or the base system that they, that, that they worked off of Athenian, and then Spartan was like. Like, you know, if you want to go a little simpler, and then all the other ones were if you want to go a little more complicated. Might not be able to be quoted on that exactly because I didn't obviously invent it, though I am I have studied it a little bit. Yeah. It's so cool to think about how different notation systems can be used for different purposes. And this is something I, I'd like to talk about with you, of course. I don't know how many equal temperaments or other sorts of systems you've encountered in the wild. Like what would you say? your experiences working with various tunings and types of tunings? Like, what have you seen in notation? Um, well, I've definitely... See, the interesting thing with with uh, the way that I've approached microtonality is that I, I, I've i very much, like, uh, have just learned what I've picked off of the the internet and, and, and articles and things like that. So um, I've definitely run into a lot of scores in 22, for instance, 22 mm -hmm. EDO. I've um, I've seen a few scores and things like Bull and Pierce. You know, if we're getting away from equal temperaments, obviously there's tons of scores in 72 EDO that you know, spectralists would have used, and people like Haas. I mean, as far as performing scores myself, I've done a little bit of 72. I've done a little bit of 24. I mean, that's kind of expected to be run into. As far as what I've written in, I quite often write in 72 and 31. I also have written in 36 before, 24, and and, and just, just JI itself. 
yeah, but uh, I mean, I, I feel like there are definitely people who have more experience than me uh, with um, with both playing and composing in it. But uh, what I like to do is that I have a little bit of both, um, or, or I, I shouldn't say a little bit, like a decent amount, decent amount of both. And and I'm definitely looking to expand more in, in both directions. Like for instance, I would I would I have yet to play a Ben Johnston quartet or anything like anything like that, but I would love to at some point. Uh, are the Kepler Quartet recordings the, the only ones that exist of the Johnson Quartets, or are there more? I actually don't know off the top of my head. You know, I don't think there are. I don't think there are any um, professional recordings besides those that the Kepler Quartet did. However, I have a good friend um, in the uh, Del Sol String Quartet, and I, as far as I understand, um, they've been looking to to record them. Uh, themselves, yeah. So, uh, so I, I'll have to check in with him about that because I'm very, uh, I'm very curious about whether they're going to continue doing that. Um, they even said that they were looking into performing the seventh quartet at one point. I remember mentioning that to me. Uh, so I think there are other people out there, but yeah, they're super challenging pieces, and a lot of people are just like, no, I'm not gonna, not gonna go there. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I would love to uh, I, someday get a group together and, and uh, perform one of them if not a, if not a couple of them especially something like the seventh you know something crazy like the seventh <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah this is just so complicated i mm -hmm. you know when i hear about the johnson quartets i i i feel really good about people's ability to play these sorts of things although of course with the with the justly tuned notation it's almost like you should understand your role in the harmony and if you don't get that then it can be really tough to play in tune but then in other situations where you create these notations for equal temperaments, like using ups and downs, you have to have that similar level of understanding. But if it's not rooted in J.I., I, I feel like there's not as much of an acceptance towards that. So, you know, there's various strategies to, to get around that um, using equal tempered logic. Um, I was wondering if you, uh, there's an idea that I think is running around that I think might be pretty solid for a lot of these situations where people don't want to learn a particular equal temperament, but... Uh, do want to read something highly gradated, like using 72 tone equal temperament or something similar to approximate an equal tuning that is lower, but with just like a small discrepancy somewhere yeah. in the intervallic structure, like 11 tone equal temperament, but like one of the intervals is just a little wrong. Uh, I was wondering if you've ever run into anything like that or what you think about that as a strategy. Well, I've actually, I've thought about that as a strategy before, for sure. Like there are times when I will want to get certain sounds in an ensemble, um, but one of the instruments is locked into 12. And as a result, you're, you're compelled to use a tuning that has 12 with, uh, contained inside of it for that reason. Or, or I mean, maybe you could put one of the other instruments in a different tuning, but I find that sometimes if, if, you're, if you're on a short schedule, as, as has been a couple of cases with some of the pieces I've written, um, it's helpful to have everyone in the same kind of grid, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I've, I've definitely thought about that. And also using, um, I, I was act I'm actually literally composing a piece right now where, um, where I use 72 and there's a piano part in the piece, but the rest of it is strings. And I, I, I like to explore temperaments like, like, you know, Miracle 10 or something like that, which is, you know, kind of similar in some ways since it's a regular uh, temperament. Um, and, uh, and and finding ways to show how like the piano and and this miracle tuning can can find uh, points of coordination is quite interesting, I think, for sure, uh, where some of the notes will line up. And then, of course, other notes completely won't line up or I should say pitches. Um, yeah, so, so that kind of thing is just me. Um, but but I, as far as approximating other uh, equal temperaments, um, it's interested me, but I've never explored it quite yet in my actual compositions. Absolutely. One thing I will add, though, that, that that I have been quite interested in lately is actually, and and you you touched upon it with the idea of uh, not necessarily using microtonality to approximate JI, and that's just the idea of free microtonality and even just free free pitch in general, and that's actually something that I really explored quite heavily in in the album I, I sent to you, uh, Fire Firebird. Um, oh yes, the yeah. Uh... yeah. Yeah. The experimental one with uh, sounds like things. Yeah, sounds like things. Um, sounds like things is my duo. It's a project that I started in twenty um, early twenty twenty with my very good friend Andrew Stoffer and and Andrew. Um, he, his basis is, is a he's more of an experimental percussionist with less of a background in classical music. And as a result, like he doesn't he's not the kind of person who thinks immediately from a notational perspective. He thinks more from a let's try hitting these things and moving these things around and 
you know, doing weird things to them and see what happens. And, and I find that I, uh, that I really enjoy working with that because I have a kind of more sort of like, how would I construct this kind of, kind of brain, you know, as a, a being a more classically trained composer. So it's very, very fun working with Andrew in that regard. Um, uh, and especially interesting when we get into the kind of uh, microtonal world, because his brain is more like, I like that sound. That sounds interesting. Let's try to like lock it in a little bit more. Whereas I'm like, what kind of chord is that? I'm trying to figure out that out. And, and when the two of them kind of come together, we end up doing some interesting stuff that way, where where it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily all intentional. It's more experimenting around until we find something we like. And the harmony might be a completely bizarre, very hard to notate harmony. And, and we just go, we like the way this sounds. Um, and uh, it was very interesting using that kind of free pitch to help describe the poetry of um, of Keith Heller, who was the other collaborator in that project. Yeah, I can imagine those uh, those contrasts and perspective were really um, refreshing in the compositional process, as you've described. Um, Absolutely, and I think you can kind of hear that in the album. There were things that happened with fire before when I could not speak. I am not certain that fire is the correct word. The first was the burning inside the girl, then completely separate from her, on its own. The second thing was a flock of skeletons, flaming birds. She was frightened. There were fire marshals signaling. This is illegal, they said. With enormous effort, I prevented myself thinking the thing inside the match that wanted out. And then, because I had to, because the fire could not be prevented, I wrote this. Of course, I want to ask the basic question, what tuning system is it in? Uh, yeah, there, there is literally no tuning system in this Ooh. in this track. One big part of our project is that we use found object instruments and we tend to modify them as little as possible. So those bell sounds that you heard, what those actually are, um, for the most part, there are a few exceptions, are uh, these candle holders that we found in a, in a thrift shop. And they look like these little bells. And when you turn them upside down and hit them with a hammer, they, they made this in really interesting gamut of pitches. And actually that bom, 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 you know, like that kind of that, that that thing that you were talking about, um, that's actually those those candle holders. And Wait, just, you mean just like that opening, like do re, uh, the do re mi thing, like that is just the candles? Yeah, yeah. Those are we have. Uh, I think we have five of them, and they all look the same, but they all have completely different pitches to them. And one of and actually two of them are like almost a perfect quarter tone apart. Um, oh, that's so cool! Yeah, it was really, really fun messing around with those. And and then the other element of that um, of that particular work is um, uh, Andrew owns this beautiful handmade dulcimer, hammer dulcimer, <gasps> and it was uh, it was sitting in his um, in his closet for a long time. And basically, what happened was he he took it out of this closet, um, and it, it's actually it was made for his. Um, his wife, I believe, uh, uh, a few years ago, and uh, basically it was extremely out of tune. Like, in fact, there was there were there were there was not even much rhyme or reason to the uh, to the strings. Like, one that was supposed to be higher would be lower, and all kinds of stuff like this. Um, <laughs> but what we did was we sort of looked at it from the perspective of a of, a, of an object again, like it's an in situ kind of object where we just said, okay, we're going to use the pitches that are on this thing. Um, oh. and, and that's that's kind of what we did. We just looked for interesting interesting patterns and interesting things to use. And once we had that material from that instrument, we had the material from the bells. We had these very bizarre and uh, sometimes oddly consonant or sometimes very discordant uh, kind of chords and harmonies that we could that we had recorded as samples. Um, and then we basically found a way to put them into a context. So a lot of those swells that you heard, um, there's two kinds of swells in, in Runaway. One of them was created by me on the, on the cello, basically multi-tracking. And it, it, there's one chord, which is you know, a pretty obvious um, uh, C, 
uh, C harmonic, uh, 11 limit harmonic series kind of type chord. Oh, I and heard that one. That yeah, was yeah, sort of yeah. later in the yeah. two minute yeah, thing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then, and then there's, um, then there are, are other ones that are much more dissonant, but I tried to basically create a few of these different chords by messing around with a few, uh, sort of improvisational, uh, multi-tracking and, um, uh, and then we had those to add to the kind of set of, of these of these uh, pitches that we had. And and then on top of that, we we tried incorporating more standard things like there's an upright piano in the piece uh, uh, later on. And actually, um, that that uh, bell like chord that you heard, um, the, the place where the, the, the tolling kind of happens on, at regular intervals, that's a mixture of a, a, a piano chord, I, I believe, just a basic octatonic mode type chord that I played on the piano. Uh, mixed with those bells, those those candle holder bells, and as a result, they're they're in completely different systems of of, of tuning from one another. But uh, just by chance, they happen to have find this very interesting kind of locked in sort of sound that makes it sound like an actual like much larger bell with the way that the the partials sort of combine with one another. So um, there are a lot of things like that where we look at it much more from a from a perspective of looking for a sound. Um, and and not so not being so concerned with what the theoretical details of that sound is. It's more so looking at microtonality from a, a free form, a sort of exploratory perspective. It was very very fun to create Runaway in that regard. There's also l later on, if you, if you listen, um, we also had a vibraphone. When I hear this and I I'm listening to some of the notes that I'm getting from the found sounds you've described, they're very much not. Like, they're not within those scales that would be implied by that first, like, little, like, do, re, mi hit. Mm -hmm. If you were to have, like, A, B, C, and then, like, chords that come in that have, like, B quarter flat and then, like, C quarter sharp and things like that that are sort of nested within. You know, it makes me think that the justness of the sounds or the non-justness of the sounds or the character of them. Like, there's something about selective hearing that can delineate concordance between these parts. Like, yes. I know that this repetitive hit is going on, and that's, like, the grounded element, and then there are these disparate, like, spectral cool things, which you're very much expecting, but each one tastes so different. And yep. you can kind of imagine it on its own, because it's a different element, and you have a, a similar element. Like, I, I kind of explored this a little bit in one of the tracks from my Emoji album. There's one where I use Doug Blumeyer's Ed Harmonic uh, tuning okay. system. It's and there's there's a part where I just like use chords that have like sharp nines and things and stuff. And it's restated like the a theme but then completely unrelated near just chords in different keys come in but you can recognize oh, their justness even though it's completely not a part of the first system It's really interesting. Yeah, I, I love stuff like that because, um, well, th there's a lot of there are a lot of elements that go into um, into the way that the ear perceives something. Uh, yes. it's, such, it's such an incredibly complicated thing. It's like um, way too interesting for its own good. It's not even oh, fair. Oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. And it, I. Uh, I always find it unfortunate when when people get this kind of attitude that like oh just intonation that that is the that is the epitome of of uh, purity of tone you know like that 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 is the uh, epitome <laughs> of of consonants people who basically don't study microtonality or don't know much about it you go like oh listen to this oh listen how how uh, consonant it is and you know it's some like really locked in eleven limit harmony and they go oh that sounds so discordant you know it, it's it's a very oh. Yeah, I, I have showed that I have done that before with people. I say, that sounds discordant to you. That sounds like the most locked in gorgeous chord ever. And they go like, oh, it's so out of tune. That say. is so you know? cool that yeah, you would say yeah, that. I've yeah. I've experienced that reaction among lots of different people. And I don't yeah. have the relevant data, but that just gave me like a silly idea. Like musician reacts to J.I. With the nails <laughs> like them covering their ears. Yeah, yeah, that would be really funny. I could definitely see that being a being a hilarious like 
nerded up version of those kinds of videos i would i would be totally there to see that, that, that yes would there are yeah. different reactions to jay i think mm -hmm. you have that discordant reaction i also have that reaction like when i when i would show it to musicians and i'm using like sawtooth waves mm -hmm. they always will say it's like a car horn or like yeah, animals yeah. fighting um yeah. and then when i show it to non-musicians they're like ah it doesn't sound much different and then <laughs> Like when I show when I show people things that are near JI, but it's not like a really locked in instrument. Like if there's some like natural pitch variation, I think it's generally found beautiful. Although it really depends on the JI. Yeah. Like you'd even be surprised, of course, at like seven limit. Like I play a septimal minor third for somebody who I invited to my apartment once in college, and they just like laugh their head off. Like that sounds so silly. You yeah, know? I know. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's that kind of thing is very funny. Um. But like um, bringing that whole idea back to the point that you made about, um, about where we were talking about using this kind of free method and, and despite the fact that uh, you are using these com completely different systems, you can still pick out the, the differences between these systems. Like, like if there's a JI chord living in the middle of this thing that's completely unrelated to, I find that there are a few interesting things at play. One of them is that classic musicians, composers kind of edict, which is uh, repetition legitimizes. Uh, yes. And I actually find that that it, 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 you know, despite it being a little bit of a cliche now, like it, it is very, very true. Like if you have enough of these bell chords, eventually the bell chords become the ground, like you said, and and they start sounding. Oh, okay, I am used to this world. This world seems like the the place that's home, and now I can I can use this world as a sort of reference point for the other things that are happening around it, and in using that reference point, it starts to make other things make more sense. And, Absolutely. And it's a very interesting perceptual thing that way. And um, and and yeah, I mean, I've got to say, uh, creating this album um, with Andrew and Kaif, uh for me was very, it was very liberating in a lot of ways because um, I've, over the last uh, couple of years, become much more of an improvisationally minded musician. Although there are a lot of very complicated and wide variety of, of things that can be achieved with notation. There are an infinite number of things that can't be achieved with notation. When one is improvising and creating these sort of found sounds and working with object instruments, um, you almost immediately get pulled into that world of, of stuff that you you would have a very hard time notating or, or, or suggesting a, a method of even recording it. It operates in a way that would be very complicated for notation to try to translate. How would you even begin to notate a runaway? You'd be like, okay, there's 12 here. There's like video here there's a free pitch here there you know it, it would be insanely complicated score and yet oh, all we were doing so was cool oh my god i i would love to see that i i mean it would take hours and hours of uh, like just from my perspective thinking about how i if i were to try to notate it it would it would be a it would be a really insane project but at the same time when we created it we were really just kind of i don't want to say messing around because we were very mindfully uh, mindfully messing around, but like, of course. It, 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 you know, I mean, that's, that's basically it, the process that, that, that it was for us was a very sort of simple, intuitive process. There wasn't anything complicated about it in, in a way. I mean, it got complicated when we started mixing it, all the ideas and, and sort of um, putting them together music concrete style. But, uh, but the process of actually recording them was as simple as, mm, I don't like that sound. Ooh, that's an interesting sound. Do that it again. What kind of process guided the uh, the idea to put sounds in a particular place that you were recording. If we talk about this two minute section, like, were you like, oh, we're going to alternate between a really strange sound and a really familiar sound? Or did you just record them in an order and put them in an order? Did you like scatter the frequency of the sound somewhat in a certain way? Like, what was that process? A lot of it was actually informed by the poetry. The poetry was recorded as a book on tape beforehand. And what we did was we added music to the poetry, whereas a lot of the time it would be, you know, a kind of um, like perhaps they would have been created together or perhaps even the other way around. Um, but but in, in our project, we had the recordings that Kaith made and they're, they're gorgeous recordings um, in that, you know, she she is so personally attached to this poetry. It's very raw and very uh, heartfelt. For, from from our approach, basically, we were looking at these recordings that she made and we were being like, how do we kind of create a sound world for these words to live in? How do we 
how do we say the things that the poetry can't quite say with words alone? Like mm. there has to be a reason for the music to exist uh, because otherwise you're just adding fancy, fancy sounds to words that so you, you have to be expressing something that the words perhaps only suggest. Um, and we thought of it really from, from that perspective of how, how do like, sometimes there will be a cello line playing, but at the same time, there'll be a weird plastic, you know, crinkling around or, or sometimes we even have like, uh, I mean, we, we used boiling water. Um, we used the sound of gardening gloves being shook, you know, all kinds of stuff like that, but that, that might appear in context as somebody playing a snare drum. We didn't want to take Kite's um, poetry too literally because then it kind of becomes uh, foley art in, in right. that way. Like, you know, we, we don't want her to be like talking about, you know, be, beside me was the fire and, 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 you know, just make, make a fire sound, you know, like we didn't <laughs> want to necessarily do that or, or, um, or have her talking about being at a river. And well, actually there is one part where she talks about being at a river and we have a, we have a field recording of a river playing. I mean, sometimes we do do it, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, but a lot of the time we didn't want to be too obvious about it. We wanted to kind of communicate the flavor of the words. And in doing so, this is largely uh, what the process that you've talked about, how, how we select um, the sounds to put together in, in the way that we did. It was meant to serve the text. <laughs> The girl, you cannot even remember her name. Ash, eye bone, cinder of skull, the residue mute. I did not see her grave. I did not see how she could be properly buried in a town that was all one blade balanced on the knife at the table's edge. The vibraphone is still just in 12 EDO, of course, but in, within yeah. the context of everything else, it, it doesn't sound very 12-y to me. It sounds like no, it quite, quite weird. And that's just because of in the context that it's put in, it, it sounds like it, it, it basically clashes with the other, with the other material and, um, or I shouldn't say clashes, but, but uh, interacts with the other material in such a way that it, uh, it, I find it confuses my ear into thinking that it's not 12 video at all there. Um, it is quite a confusing uh, flavor. Yeah. I think um, you're uh, the candle holder and that vibraphone have different tuning standards. So they, that they is do. Yeah. probably part of it. Yeah, that vibraphone, it kind of sounds like it's it's twiddling around in like some small area and then occasionally it goes up it, it in pitch and sort of expands out and then the scale is different there, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Yeah, no, that, that, I mean, basically what we did was we had this vibraphone, we had it in a, in a nice uh, room uh, like that was nice and quiet. Um, and we just, I just hit record and I, and um, and excuse me, Andrew and I, um, and mostly Andrew just tried twiddling around on it a little bit and looking for different uh, kind of sounds. Um, in that particular instance, we were like, oh, let's try to do something chromatic and kind of Ligeti-esque because we, we both we both are Ligeti fans. <laughs> and the, the, the micro polyphony in, within the sort of um, vibraphone, uh, we, I, I find that it complements the sort of sound of the river because the river has a very sort of similar uh, uh, characteristic, uh, sonic characteristic. Um, in the way that it has this sort of rolling feeling and this kind of uh, close and 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 uh, intimate sort of sort of feeling that that particular field recording of the river. Another work, actually, that would be great to talk about would be um, In the Refuge of a Cave. Oh, yes, I saw yeah, that. Yeah, I saw that yeah. other people uh, played on that. I think yes. I heard the Andrew Friedman one. Uh, oh, yes. Okay, yeah. Andrew Friedman's a, a friend of mine, uh, uh, of course, clarinetist. We, we went to the same school together. But um, yeah, I've, uh, I've, had, um, uh, I've had seven people now do it. Um, the, the kind of idea behind the project was it was it, 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 it was my official unofficial COVID project um, right. and that I wanted to create a work of music uh, where people who were isolated could feel like they were playing chamber music. Um, and, and in doing that, I, I created a Max MSP patch 
that would basically work as a kind of um, delay filter, but the delay filter retuned each echo to a different oh. pitch. Yeah. So so instead of ba 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 ba, you you instead when you make a sound, you would get dum bum 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 bum, and it repeats and it makes this little melodic line. Um, and the particular uh, the tuning of it is it's actually I would say it's my only work that's an extremely pure um, o tonal JI. Uh, the the entire series is all um, it's octave reduced, but it's uh, but it's basically. Um, uh, 17 limit, 17 limit um, JI, and I, I kind of turned it into a sort of tone row, if you, oh, yeah. if you will. And then what happens is that um, when one uh, plays, uh, they have this Max MSP patch running with them, and they can hear it in their ears as they're recording it. And then the part of the rule of the piece is that the the determining factor of the tempo for the work, uh, actually, the in fact, the length of exactly one bar within the work is the exact same length as one repetition of the echo cycle. So you, you have to actually be play directly with yourself in order to play the piece. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so in that sense, it really truly is chamber music with yourself. And the, the kind of idea behind it was I, I wanted to take this idea and transpose it into a metaphor for basically what would happen if one was isolated within a cave. And they had to make music inside of a cave being isolated by themselves. And I don't know if you've ever been in, in a cave, um, like a deep cave, but the echoes yes. are absolutely bizarre that, that you hear in there. And, and I thought, well, why not make a piece based off of this kind of cave-like echoes? And then the idea of being isolated within a cave is in of itself a metaphor for the situation many of us found ourselves in at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so it's this kind of, it's a sort of... Uh, a uh, cyclical uh, uh, three three part sort of metaphor. Basically, it was using that metaphor and then uh, working within a framework of JI for for that particular piece. And um, the other thing is that um, the one the one other thing I wanted to mention was that when you play a short attack, you get the melody or the tone row or whatever you want to call it, the gamut that that's created by the echo chain. But if you yeah. play a sustained pitch, then you get a chord, of course because all of the echoes back up onto one another and you get this this block harmony. Right. So, as a result, you can, you can, you can, there's another section of the piece where it's all about sustained tones and it sounds like these very rich harmonies, but, the, but it's really just all these echoes getting backed up against one another. In theory, it's playable by any instrument because it's all notated on a one line staff. The performers actually choose the pitches themselves that they play. It, and, it, and that's an actually right. an interesting contradiction within the piece because the intonation of the work, um, is entirely indeterminate from the perspective of the performer. Right, it's they can pick whatever they want. It doesn't yeah, have to they be- They can pick whatever they want, yeah, yeah. But um, despite that fact, the overall tuning of the work is JI because no matter what you play, you're going to get a response back from the filters that form an exact JI relationship with whatever pitch it is you're playing. On one end, we have like extreme chaos. And on the other end, we have extreme order. Um, and they actually completely interact with one another in, in that regard. That's um, a very good way to, I think, disentangle a tuning label that would really not be very descriptive of the work. If someone were to just simply call it free pitch, well, what sort of order have we constrained upon this thing? A lot yeah. of it is about how, like, how the tuning is used, so I wonder what the correct label would be. I guess maybe you could say um, indeterminate pitch with JI-based components or JI-based harmony. Um, but even then, I guess yeah. you're getting into the specifics of, of what it would mean. I, it's hard to hard to really think of what that would be. Like if you if you had to explain that to somebody in a really short way and, and say what the tuning was, what, what would you call it? You know, I, to be honest, I haven't even thought of that. I always considered it to be at its heart a, a, a JI work. But yeah. But you know, I mean. Um, in the end, uh, the JI is really only from the perspective of the digital processing. So I would say that it's, um, you know, one, one thing I have actually used to describe it is I say it's JI inspired in a, in a way. <laughs> oh, I like that. Uh, yeah, That's yeah, great. yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's, if it's perfect, but I feel like it makes sense in, in a way. I mean, I, I definitely have been moving more and more towards uh, being less rigid. In, in tuning systems in general and, and finding ways to mix them together. I think that in a lot of ways that is um, that is at the at, at the core of a lot what, of what I'm doing with microtonality and um, and Zen harmonicism uh, now. It's the idea of of anything goes and what is most important is just let's find an interesting way to, way to make it work kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. 
That's a great approach. Um, I think an approach that um, people naturally evolve to as they as they work more and more with this stuff. I find the longer composers have been around it and have been doing it, the more they tend to incorporate not only polystylism but also um, polysystemic tuning. You could just call it free Zen harmonicism too. <laughs> yeah, you could. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Or just Zen harmonicism in general. I, I mean, you know, like the idea of uh, of a of a <laughs> of a Gesamtkunstwerk of of Zen harmonicism. <laughs> Maybe that's a little megalomaniacal, but but it, it's an interesting <laughs> thing to, to look at that way. That's yeah. fun, though. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I love that. It's um because like when you have polysystemic things, you know, um, I mean, a lot of those, if you were to juxtapose two tuning systems, you almost have like uh, a generally either polytonal situation or a situation where like. There's matching contour, but the contours are different. But then in this situation, you have polysystemic tuning where the performer chooses some kind of system for themselves, and then there's other like tuning systemic consequences. So it's like a it's like a double system. very much love how when that happens you get this sensation that there are there are many pitches that are part of the chord and yeah, then some of them fade in and out such that like there was something that was there but you didn't notice it and now you're noticing it because there's just so many elements present in it that could be a really agreeable way to present these sort of sorts of like really large chords with lots of uh with lots of notes in them to, to basically take each pitch and then kind of add a J.I. branch off of each of them? Or, or sorry, yeah, I, I potentially, was, yeah, yeah. potentially yeah. adding J.I. branches and potentially also having like disparate elements that sort of fade in and out in like a twinkling way. Or, you know, of course, you can just hit them with that chord really hard. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's totally true. Uh, I also have an orchestral work called Vision of a Flax and Sea, and I wrote that in... Um, uh, late 2018. It was kind of just as I was like getting heavily into microtonality, um, but I I didn't write that piece with any kind of microtonal um, systems. It's all in 12 EDO, but there's these very, very thick, thick chords that I use in it. And at, at, like, especially in the string section in which they're divisying into like, well, sometimes I think as many as uh, 22 different pitches. Uh, or, or, or something like that. Um, and there's one part where I have one of these chords and then the string musicians all have to do a collective glissando up a minor third and then down a minor third. And some of the some of the harmony, like people obviously gliss at different rates and some of the resulting harmonies are, are very strange, you know, just because of the fact that, uh, that, that it's a very complicated chord. And um, so it sort of reminds me of that a little bit. It's sort of a, it's kind of a hack for, for making stuff microtonal without ever giving anybody uh, accidentals that freak them out <laughs> and in right. my experience it's hard it's hard to throw uh throw that kind of stuff into an orchestral work uh people are yeah definitely uh it, it can definitely make people frown a bit <laughs> <laughs> It's exciting for sure that uh, this is definitely becoming less of a fringe thing, which is uh, has always made me just kind of shake my head because like every <laughs> single culture and movement and music, uh, you know, if you look at it from a more global perspective, has had a different kind of tuning system and a different approach to to pitch, you know, entirely different approach to pitch sometimes. So, yeah, it's, it's it's cool. It's cool to see that it's it's permeating popular culture more. Um, it's very promising and exciting to me.
Well, it's been super cool chatting with you. And um, so thank you again so much for your time. And um, it's a pleasure to be on the podcast. I'm, uh, you know, whenever that ends up being. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, checking out the, the episodes uh, that are that are coming up. And um, yeah, uh, let me know when you have something put together. And I'm really excited to see it. Absolutely. See you later. Yeah, see you later. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Now and Zen. Be sure to catch Nicholas Protzek's work on Bandcamp as well as on SoundCloud. And on Bandcamp, be sure to check out his two-man ensemble, Sounds Like Things, with their album, Firebird. A special thanks to our patrons, our Zen Harmonic patrons, as well as our Zen Harmonic gods, Mike Battaglia, Sheldon Bird, Barry Lemon, Adam Fries. Matthew Sheeran, Vincenzo Sicarella, Hector McGuffin, Christopher Bailey, Leland O. Weigel, Amy Coleman, Joe Weigel, and Tina Harmon Carto. Of course, if you want the most updates on the podcast, all of the inner workings, as well as the bonus episodes, check out the Patreon account. Thanks so much for listening, and catch you next time. (laughs) 